Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the History Center of Olmsted County, and thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Madeline Lawler, and I am the education coordinator here. Um, my boss would be disappointed if I didn't plug our membership program, and my favorite line to do so is by saying, this could be free if you were a member. Um, and we have some exciting upcoming programs, um, most pressing. Uh, Lee Hilgendorf and the uh, history of airports in Rochester. But then on Saturday, we have a decorate your own Wunderkammer activity. It's, gauged, it's geared towards uh, kids, but I enjoyed it. And uh, we have some other really excited volunteers. Uh, and then in February, we have Phil Wheeler coming back to talk about immigration then and now in Southeast Minnesota. So you guys, found us, so you guys trust you can find that lecture again. But anyway, without further ado, here is Lee. Thank you. Thanks, Madeline. Dom DeLuise, you always used to say, save it for the end. I, you, <laughs> you, may not, you may not like that. So, uh, If you go to the uh, research section of the uh, History Center's web page, and you type the word airplane or aeroplane in our case into the uh, newspaper index this is going to be the first story you're going to run into um january 27th 1911 the uh rochester model airplane club was formed uh their purpose was to teach aviation through the building of models uh aviation of course was less than 10 years old at that time so this is the means they were going to do it. The, the two things you want to take away from here is, first of all, the, uh, the president of the organization, who was Arthur Ellis. Arthur Ellis was the uh, chauffeur for Dr. Christopher Graham. You may have heard of Christopher Graham. 35 years he worked for Christopher. And the other thing, the club that night uh, made it their goal to bring an actual airplane to Rochester. Well, this is 1911. We're going to bring a real airplane. We're going to bring it here for the fair in September. And we're going to show you what an airplane looks like. And uh, that was met with the usual coughs and coughing. So what they did was they teamed up with the Rochester Businessmen's Club. Uh, the Rochester businessmen were working on trying to save the fairgrounds. Um, Pop quiz, does anybody know where the fairgrounds were in 1911? If you go to Dairy Queen on the Beltline, you go to the south a block from there, and you go to the east about three or four blocks, that's where the fairgrounds was located in 1911. And uh, the fair had always been in financial trouble. They're under the, uh, getting close to going under. So the Businessmen's Club thought, well, that's a good idea. Maybe we'll get people out to the fair and to see this airplane, we'll be able to save the, save the fairgrounds. So what they were able to do, um, they hired a guy named Thomas McCooey. He was a North Dakota wheat farmer. And he came down for three days, three times a day, got in this Curtis Flyer here, uh, took off, flew around the area, Buzz Broadway, there's different stories of them driving or going down Broadway and waving at people and flying back up. And uh, so he was having a pretty good time. The weather was really nice. He didn't, uh, didn't fail. He, he flew all nine rounds. The one thing that always interests me about this picture when I look at it is, where is the propeller? Well, obviously the plane is running and somebody is standing awful darn close to a propeller there. So it's... Uh, but there was no story of any injury. On the last day, uh, he, on the last trip, he took off 
uh, made his usual pass, was flying circles around and looping, climbing, diving up and down. He's about 1,500 feet. Uh, the motor coughed, wheezed, and it quit. So he's 1,500 feet in the air. People on the ground are screaming and howling. And uh, Makui was far enough out that he couldn't get back to the fairgrounds. So he went down about a quarter mile away from the fairgrounds. Of course, no one's ever seen an airplane before. Now, did we see an airplane crash? People ran out there, and uh, the airplane's sitting there undamaged. Makui is shaking the airplane, looking in the gas tank. He ran out of gas. <laughs> so uh, fuel it up, fire it up, and fly it back is what they, is what they ended up doing. Uh, I said the fairgrounds, uh, the, the fair was in financial trouble all the time. The fairgrounds actually came up for sale in the winter of 1911. Dr. Christopher Graham uh, wanted to save the fairgrounds, thought the county fair was important, wanted uh, people to be able to go there, but didn't buy it because it was too high priced. It was out of his range. Plus the fact that he realized, well, I've got a farm across the road. I just build my own fairgrounds which is what he did over the winter and in the spring of 1912. So that's where the fairgrounds comes from. And uh, thanks to a chauffeur who was Arthur Ellis, uh, there was a small patch of ground south of the racetrack that was set aside to be used for uh, an aviation field was the term that they wanted to use. It was a flying field. And uh, the flying field there from 1912 until actually 1928 was the preferred spot for people in aviation coming to Rochester to land. Um, first part of this we'll tell you is uh, kind of the story of what became known as Graham Field. Um, in 1916, 19, I believe this was, Ruth Law, Ruth Law bought her first airplane from Orville Wright. Actually, she, he wouldn't sell it to her, sold it to her husband, because Orville believed that women didn't have mechanical aptitude to learn to fly. By the end of the year, she had her pilot's license, and she was one of the first, if not the first woman in the country to have a pilot's license. And uh, she went on to put on flying demonstrations. She actually had her own flying circus. Um, had cars that follow her, followed her around. Uh, one of the tricks, and you, there's a videotape if you Google her, is uh, where they would actually drive the car around a racetrack. She would fly with the ladder dangling off of one wing and would transfer somebody out of the car to the airplane. Um, she's got, got quite the history. When she came to town, this was, like I said, it was 1916. It broke all attendance records for the county fair that there ever had been to come in and watch her fly. Um, the area that she had there, excuse me a minute. You can't hear that, it's driving me nuts. Uh, the, uh, the area that they had was very poorly maintained. And um, they kind of had a reputation of being a really rough crappy place. <clears throat> so people were kind of avoiding it. In, uh, in 1919, the, uh, the Wrigley Spearmint uh, airplanes came to town, the Wrigley Chewing Gum Company. They sent the planes out to promote the new Wrigley Spearmint gum. And the pictures are from the newspaper. There's no actual photographs that we have of this. So this is the best we're going to do. Uh, what the planes would do is they would actually bomb the city with gum. Uh, the two airplanes would fly over, somebody would throw gum out of the airplane, it was attached to a balloon, and it would come over the edge and you would get your gum. Uh, four of the uh, packs of gum actually had a ticket, and if you got one of those tickets, you could bring it in, and the next day they would take you for a ride in one of the airplanes. Uh, the day they did it, it was so windy, most of the gum blew out east of town somewhere. So if you go out to Chester Woods, there may still be gum laying around. Uh, one of the tickets was found, and a 12-year-old kid went for a ride just at the time of his life. When they first came to town, 
landed the airplane. It was so rough that one of the planes blew a tire. And after the stunt, when they came back, uh, another uh, the other airplane, when it landed, it was so rough, it actually broke a strut on one of the wings. They had to repair it before they could leave town with the thing. And at that time, Dr. Graham just happened to be at the fairgrounds to watch this. He went out the next day and hired some people to plow this area, level it, pack it, and seat it down to make it more useful. So this would have been in September of 1919. And uh, what happened is in October, if you know your history of Rochester, uh, Dr. Graham and Blanche gave the fairgrounds to Olmstead County. Uh, it was approximately 57 acres, and included in the deed was a 15-acre plot on the south side of the racetrack to be used as an aviation field. So this was actually written into the deed, and you can check the newspapers. Both newspapers at the time have a copy of it. It's right in there. So it's uh, it's an actual fact where people don't like to believe it, but they did. Uh, the county commissioners... A, couple, a month later in November, called this Graham Field. So they actually named it Graham Field. In 1920, the, um, with no assistance from the city or the county to take care of this area, they, neither, neither one was very interested in doing that. So it uh, fell upon the William T. McCoy American Post Legion number 92. And uh, the post would have been relatively new in a couple of years. Uh, the World War I was over. The veterans had come back. Many of them were pilots. And many of them wanted to use this spot as a place to take off and land. So they came out and did a lot of the maintenance work on this area. Uh, also that spring, uh, there was a car salesman in town. His name was uh, Pease, R.E. Pease. And William Yunker, these two guys formed what was called the Rochester Aircraft Company. And their idea was they were going to sell airplanes because everybody's going to want to have an airplane, right? We all have Model Ds, now we all want airplanes. Uh, they hired this man, his name was Herbert Reeby. And he was a World War I flying instructor, and he was also a fighter pilot in Europe. And uh, he would become a, a celebrity in southern Minnesota because he would go to small towns with the airplane and he would uh, give rides to people, demonstrate the airplane. So he was quite the draw all summer long in 1920. And uh, the American Legion Post in 1920 registered Graham Field as Rochester's airport with the U.S. Flying Service. Now, this was before the FAA. It was before the CAA. It was the U.S. Flying Service. That was in 1920. Uh, the summer of 1920 would be known as uh, the summer of Lottie Schirmerhorn. Lottie was, uh, she was born Charlotte Barons. Uh, she was 16 years old when she married George Schirmerhorn. George was 46. And uh, when they got married in April, one of the first things they did was George bought her a parachute. Now, how does that come about? Well, George was a, uh, oh gosh, there's a, he jumped from an airplane or jumped from a, a balloon, a gas balloon. He'd go to the county fair. This would be in the 1890s, 1900 era. He would ascend uh, an aeronaut is the word I'm looking for is what they called him. Or an aeronaut maybe. He went up in this balloon to about 3,000 feet and then bailed off. And, uh, of course, the balloon would come down somewhere. George would float down, and everybody would go crazy. It was a pretty good time. And uh, Lottie thought that sounded like fun. So he bought her a, a parachute. They had Herbert Reeby come out and uh, was the uh, pilot. And she made her first jump out on the farm. Bought the parachute, the guy sold it to her, packed it up, jumped out of the airplane. See, there's nothing to it. Packed it back up, put it on Lottie. There you go. Oh, yeah, you're right. There's nothing to it. But uh, 
they were out on the farm with that one. The uh, that would make her probably the first woman in Minnesota, definitely, maybe even in, in the country, to parachute out of an airplane. This is in summer of 1920. Um, who in their right mind is going to jump out of a perfectly good airplane? They were. <laughs> but um, the uh, the first uh, the first commercial thing that they did was fly at the Winona County Fair over in St. Charles. And they were absolutely convinced the temperance movement was absolutely pounding their fist that she was thrown out of the airplane. They had a trap door because nobody's ever going to jump out of an airplane. She went up and goes, oh, watch. She did it again. So uh, she was scheduled into the Olmstead County Fair. The first night of the fair, she um, is flown by Herbert Reeby here. They get up to an altitude of about 1,000 feet. Lottie climbs over the side of the airplane and jumped, and the people on the ground just gasped to think that she would jump out of this airplane. Dead silence, except for Herbert flying away. Parachute opened up in a couple of seconds, and Lottie's on her way down, and she is giggling and laughing and kicking her feet. This is just the biggest thing in the world to her. And she lands right in front of the fairground grandstands. Like, kaboom, there she is. And she jumped up and waves at everybody. And, and, of course, the crowd went wild after that. So uh, the fairgrounds in the mid-20s, Graham Field would be the base for several flying schools, including Northwest Flying Service. And uh, that, that's on the sign here. Most of the instructors were World War I veterans that not only gave flying lessons, but they would also give rides on the weekend. You could go out and for a few dollars, you could fly around Rochester and see things you'd never seen before. One such pilot was Fred Toogood, a name that might be familiar to somebody here. Uh, Fred was known uh, for his dead stick landings. He would line up with the runway, reach up, shut the motor off. And he would glide in while people were screaming and yelling. So. Uh, if the plane looks like it's in an unfamiliar place, uh, it's because it is. This is Knowlton's department store downtown. The plane was disassembled, brought in, reassembled as a way to, to advertise the flying school. And if you look at the sign, you'll see on the sign that it does say that the uh, Rochester Airport and the office is in the fairground buildings. So when people say there was never an airport there, I rest my case. There it is. Um, in 1925, again, the, the um, American Legion came out and they modified the airfield, but this time they had the city of Rochester and Olmstead County helped them out. They brought equipment down there as men came out and they worked over the field and they actually had enlarged it just a little bit. And at that time, it was registered with the uh, the new Civil Aeronautics Authority, the CAA. And in celebration for the dedication, they had a motor derby. And down here on the bottom, oops, down here on the bottom, you'll see that they had a flying circus. They had airplane races in 1925. They raced out there. They also had motorcycle races, auto polo, if you know what auto polo is. There's something you can Google. That'll scare the crap out of you. Um, and they also uh, had push ball which, with cars, which is kind of like what it sounds like. We get a big ball, we get a couple Model Ts, and we start smashing into each other. But uh, this is the, uh, the motor derby that would celebrate the, uh, the new modified fairgrounds that they had. In uh, November 25th, of 1927 should be a red letter day in Rochester aviation history. Uh, these two gentlemen came to Rochester and what you have here is, uh, this is Colonel Lewis Britton and the guy standing beside him is Charles Speed Holman. And if you've ever heard of Holman Field in St. Paul, this is the man that it's named after. Uh, Speed Holman was a nickname he got when it was motorcycle riding days. It wasn't uh, an airplane thing at all. He had that name. He really didn't like it, but everybody called him Speed Holman. But these two guys came down on the day after Thanksgiving, 
And Colonel Britton was the CEO of Northwest Airways. Northwest Airways uh, made a delivery of Christmas seals to Rochester because Rochester had run out. And Holman was his chief pilot. The two of them went to a luncheon at the Kaler Hotel where they were speaking about how Rochester needed to have an airport that had an uh, air mail specification runway which was 3,000 feet long and 300 feet wide. This is what the federal government required. And there was nothing like that here. And th what they were doing is they flew from Minneapolis to Chicago. And the, this was during the going into the winter. They had spent the first winter with this contract flying from, you'd fly from Chicago to La Crosse. They would make the turn at La Crosse and then follow the Mississippi River up to St. Paul until your engine falls off. And then you have water or you have rough terrain 25 miles on either side. So there's a good chance you're not going to make it. I know it's a whole lot safer if we fly to Rochester and fly up Highway 55 or 52 because it's all flat land. So that's what they were here for. They were trying to persuade the city to build this runway so their business had a safe place to, to uh, operate from. Uh, at that luncheon, there were actually three different groups of people that would be influenced by what these guys said that day. And the first one would be the American Legion. Uh, this photograph was taken in 1931, August of 31. And... It, uh, it shows the, the fairgrounds, of course, which is down here. Here's the grandstand that Lottie jumped and fell in front of. This little spot here is the original flying field. And the American Legion went to Dr. Graham, who owned all of this land around here, and explained to them, explained to him what they wanted to do. And he said, okay. So that Monday they went out and they took out fences along this area and straightened and leveled this up. And uh, within 30 days, by the end of 1927, by January 1st, this is a 3,000 foot long runway that's 300 feet wide, that's airmail specification. Took 30 days to build it. Uh, of course, winter sets in, so not much is going to happen through the winter. But this is in 1927. Uh, like I said, this is from 1931, and this is the airport over here. You'll see that. And if you go down here, this is today 20th Street. This is 3rd Avenue. If you follow this up, you'll end up at Starbucks. But uh, that's the area that you're looking at there. Um, they would, like I said, they had a, a 3,000 by 300 foot runway. And if you ever have a chance to walk between 1st Avenue and 2nd Avenue along 16th Street in this area right here, if you look up either of those streets that are in area there now, it's flat as a board. It is straight as an arrow. It's because it used to be an airport runway up there. And people look at you like, you're nuts. There was never an airport there. So, well, yeah, there was. The second group of people, five businessmen from Rochester, or four from Rochester, one actually from, I believe, Plainview. Um, that was Lester Fiegel, Henry Postier, David, uh, Dr. T.J. Moore, Jess Huron, and George Stanky. Welcome to Rochester Airways. This is another one that nobody knew anything about. Uh, Rochester Airways was located on Highway 14 West, which today is 2nd Street Southwest. And these guys went out and they rented 40 acres of land. And their motivation was uh, in March of 1928, there was a newspaper story about the Jefferson Transportation Company, the Jefferson Bus Company, basically. 
they announced that they had bought or ordered a new Ford trimotor airplane, and they were going to have passenger service from the Twin Cities to Rochester twice a day. That was their goal. These guys got all excited, went out and got this piece of land, and built this on this 40 acres, they built another 3,000 foot by 300 foot runway. And let's see if we can see it. There you go. You can kind of see how it runs down this way and back. And uh, the, the sole purpose of this is that they were going to have uh, this, all the airmail traffic was going to come through here, and then all the passenger service was going to come through here, and they were going to make a fortune. And not quite so much. <laughs> um, what they did was, uh, if you want to, a reference for what you're looking at right now. This is today, Second Street. And if you turn in here, this is now uh, the lake, Cascade Lake. And this corner right up here is uh, 23rd Avenue Southwest. It goes up a hill. There's a bluff in the corner. These pictures were taken on the day that the airport was dedicated. Uh, this would have been in June. And what they did was uh, they had 13% of the U.S. Army's Air Corps was in Rochester for this, the fighter planes. They're out of Michigan. And uh, they were on a tour. They came in here. And you can see, if you look along the edge here, you can see this is all biplanes. There's a couple of bombers here. The, uh, the white circle is the target when you come in for a landing. Of course, everything would have been visual that day. Oh, there's the white circle. If you stick her down there, you get a lot of room to roll out in any direction around here, which is what they what they had built it for. Um, they came in and 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 said that this was going to be the, the latest thing in the airports. The city came out and they said this is going to be a municipal airport. Boy, we're we're going places now. Uh, if you look at ground level that kind of that same view you're looking across to the west, the country club is back up here on the hill. But you can see all the bombers lined up here. It would have been quite an impressive show. Uh, aerial dogfighting, they did mock dogfighting. They had people standing on the roof of the Kaler Hotel watching. That's, you know, because it was only a mile away. So they were really out there taking, uh, taking in the view. Uh, what happened to them was, this would have been on July 9th of 1928, about a, a month after they had dedicated the airport. Uh, Jefferson Airways president and his chief pilot, Pat Gallup, arrived in their new Ford trimotor, and they were going to inspect landing fields for their business. So they landed here. Uh, Pat Gallup had been a pilot for the Ford Motor Company, had over 3,000 hours flying experience. He was Pretty well experienced in the in the uh, in flying and designing of the of the Ford trimotor, and he didn't like the place because there was a bluff in the southwest corner. And if I'm taking off into the southwest, I've got to clear this bluff. No, I don't think so. So here they are leaving, and they're heading over to Graham Field, and they get to Graham Field, and he goes, "This is where we want to be. It's unobstructed." For a half mile every direction, there's nothing here. It's all flat land. He says, this is what we've got to have. And um, I always like to tell the story, if you've ever seen Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, where the sheriff is trying to recruit a posse to go after Butch and Sundance, and the guy comes up with the bicycle and says, well, you know, you got the crowd. I'll, I got something I want to sell. Uh, same thing happened. They're at, uh, at Graham Field deciding that this is what they're going to do. And Mayo officials got up and said, as long as you got the crowd, we just want to let you know we're going to build a new airport across the road. All righty then. I guess that's that. Uh, four days later, this would have been the 13th of July, 1928, the first passenger service from Rochester flies to the Twin Cities. This was scheduled passenger service twice a day. They flew on Jefferson Airways, their brand new Ford trimotor. 
and they left Rochester, would fly up to the cities, landed in Minneapolis and flew over to St. Paul and came back to Minneapolis, came back to Rochester. And then the, to, to kill time in between, they would take a sightseeing around Rochester if they really wanted to before they would head back up. So uh, this was this was the um, was Graham Field. Um, there was one more group that was at that luncheon to hear them speak, and um, that would have been the Mayo Clinic. Welcome to Rochester Airport. Uh, on May 31st of 1928, the first emergency patient to be flown to Rochester landed at Graham Field. Two days later, a second patient arrived by air. And these events inspired Henry Plummer to tell Dr. Will, you need to have an airport. Because if you don't have an airport here, they're going to go to Winona. And if they go to Winona, it's going to be just like the railroads. They'd come to Winona first, then they came up here. No, he said, you've got to have your own airport. And Dr. Will kind of, yeah, it sounds like a pretty good idea. And the legend goes, he said, go down and get Albert, Albert Lobb. Uh, he'd only worked at the clinic for about three, four years by that time. Go down and get Albert in... Uh, have them go out and see what kind of land is available. But don't tell anybody what we're doing because we don't want to jack up the price of the land. I said, okay. So uh, Albert Lobb went out southeast of Rochester, outside of the city limits, and he was able to buy 285 acres of land. Uh, they, they smoothed it out, tiled. I don't know how many miles of tile they put in this thing. Uh, it was kind of a swampy little area, and they laid a lot of tile to drain that out and get that to to work up decent. Um, again, this is 1931, in August of 31. And people always say, how do you know that? And I say, because of that building right there, which is a long story, but that's what it is. Uh, after I looked at this picture long enough, I realized that this is an actual history lesson in this picture. If you go down here, you see this semicircle? That is the infield of the racetrack from the 1890s fairgrounds. So this is where the first airplane flight in Rochester took off from. If you go over here, this is a 3,000 by 300 foot runway from old Graham Field. And now you've got 285 acres here. If you notice, there's a fence line over here. They don't own it. If you could go north or south or east or west, why do we have to go sideways across this? It'll come to them later on, but that's that's what they end up doing. Uh, Seneca plant is down over here, and they built a terminal, if you can believe it. This is on the corner of uh, 3rd and 14th. The Red Cross used to be in that building. I don't know what's there now. But this is the passenger terminal. They would get you in a car and take you out to the field where the airplane was and you take off from there. Uh, this building that became the hangar over here wasn't built until, uh, until 1929. So the first, uh, first air, airline that ran out of this place was Universal Airways, which was out of Ohio. And they operated out of this building the uh, kind of a different view of it. Again, you've got your, your target over here and all this open area where the fairground used to be. And I always thought this is kind of interesting and in how barren that neighborhood is. It's just one of those strange things that you follow. Um, Rochester became a stop on uh, the route between Minneapolis and Chicago for uh, Universal Airways. A ticket to Minneapolis one way was $7.50. You could fly to Chicago for $32.50. And when this was opened up, uh, which would have been end of October, 1st of November in 1928, all, uh, all programs at Graham Field came to a stop. Everybody transferred over here. And by March of 1929, uh, these guys over, at, uh, over here on 2nd Street had a one-year lease 
Lease ran out in March of 29. They tore their buildings down and they all moved out here too. So everything was taken apart in one central location. Uh, Universal flew for maybe seven, eight months. Uh, when they came with uh, the Jefferson outfit, closed up almost right away. They couldn't compete with them on price. They hadn't beat on price, so they just stopped flying. Uh, Universal, in May of, of uh, 29, they sold out their passenger service to Northwest Airways. It wasn't Northwest Airlines at that time, still Airways. Uh, they're in Northwest, with their first full year of service, they ran a total passenger count of 420 people through Rochester in one year. Uh, Universal Airways would reorganize. They came back as, a, as Universal Aviation, and they opened an aviation school at the airport. Uh, they also had schools in St. Paul and St. Louis, and the one in St. Louis was taught by Charles Lindbergh. And here we can see the students uh, building one of two biplanes that would be used for flight instructions at the school. There we go. Uh, in 1929, during Rochester's Diamond Jubilee, June 11th, Dr. Charles Mayo dedicated the airport. Uh, during the dedication, Speed Holman came down here. He was uh, a stunt pilot and he was taking people up for rides. And one of the last things, he had, the last flight of the day, he had a guy, Jack Rittinger was, was his name. He was a carpenter here in town. Took Jack up for a ride, got off the ground about 200 feet, banked her to port, fuel line came off the motor, airplane slid sideways down into the ground, uh, smash crash, Jack went to the hospital, bumps and bruises, I think he might have had a broken leg. Uh, Speed Holman was picked up, carried to the high school, where they had a dinner in his honor, and he told stories of his bravery and flights and all this kind of stuff. So he was he was completely unhurt. Uh, the same weekend of the dedication, the uh, Reed Murdoch plant over here, which of course is is dust now, uh, that was dedicated. That opened that same weekend, and we know it was at least 1929 because. There's no ear of corn on the horizon there. It hasn't been built yet, so we know that uh, we know that it was done that way. Um, the first permanent structure on the on the airport itself would have been this hangar. It was designed by uh, Ellerby and Associates of Rochester, who designed a lot of the Mayo Clinic buildings. It was uh, 132 feet by 84 feet. It had a small waiting room here over on the. Oops, come on back here. There we go. Small waiting room over here, some radio equipment in there, a few things. The pilots could hang out there. Uh, that uh, came online in October of 1929, and they had an open house for it. There were several thousand people showed up to, to go through the building on that one. The... Uh, Airmail first was established in Rochester on March 8th of 1930. And the uh, letter that was mailed here by nine o'clock in the morning would reach New York City by 420 in the afternoon. Uh, be a combination of flying and on the railroads to get it there. Um, in the picture here, we've got uh, postmaster is John Fuller on the left. Joseph McKeon is the president of Rochester Airways and Flying School, and are posing for a reenactment of the uh, first airmail. This would have been in uh, airmail week in 1938 is when, the, is when the picture was taken. The airport was under constant improvement. Uh, June of 38, uh, that would include the installation of a beacon on top of what is now the Plummer Building. Uh, the, this was on a 16-foot tower that was on the top of the building, and uh, this aluminum tower, the light was three foot in diameter, it was 2 million candle power, 370 feet in the air, which was tall enough to get it over the hills on the east side of town, and it could be seen for 75 miles away, they said, on the, on the tower there. Um, the uh, former light had been on top of the 
ear of corn water tower. So in um, you know, there it is. In June of 1939, Albert Lobb, and this is Albert Lobb, uh, was the president of Rochester Airport Company, and he was called to the bedside of uh, William Mayo. And Will Mayo in, in June of 39 was dying of stomach cancer. He got Albert in there and he said, uh, what do you need for the airport to make it modern? Because at that time, it was still a grass field. And Albert said, well, you know, we could use this, 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 this. Oh, okay. So make me a list. Got the list. He left. Board of Governors was called into the bedroom and said, whatever, whatever Albert needs, you give it to him and don't give him any grief. That's how Dr. Will felt about the airport. It was absolutely necess a necessity for the Mayo Clinic. Um, first things first, and these are kind of tough to see, this aerial view. Uh, the airport itself was expanded. You'll notice this corner here is now airport. But the, you can see the runways, the paved runways were put in in 39 and finished in 40. And the, uh, there was a terminal added and there was also uh, radio guidance equipment, which was the latest thing. And just to give you an idea of where you're at, this right here is uh, County One. And across the bottom here, you've got 20th Street. This is the Chicago Great Western Railroad tracks and Third Avenue is here. And the top of the airport is 13th Street. Kind of give you an idea of what was going on there. New terminal building was built. Um, looks like a drive-in restaurant to me. But uh, this, this was the new terminal building and then one of the poles there, that's part of the radio guidance equipment. The, uh, this is the inside of the terminal, um, ready to have a dance there. I don't see the TSA anywhere, so we can literally walk in the front door, buy your ticket, and walk out the back door and not see anybody. No one's going to stop you, walk out to a running airplane, and it'd be like Casablanca. You'll be gone in no time. Um, Northwest Airlines now is serving 10,000 passengers a year through uh, Rochester. In August 4th of 1940, and again, some of these pictures, you just got to take them where you can get them because there's nobody out there taking pictures of some of this stuff. Uh, this was from the top of the hangar, looking down. This would be the, the terminal building here. And this is an estimated crowd of 20,000 people showed up, paid 10 cents a piece to get in to see the new airport. And all of the airlines brought in new airplanes latest greatest most modern pieces they wanted to wanted to show off so this was on the on the 40th on uh, 1940 and here's the uh, people waiting in line to walk through a dc-3 which would have been again a brand new airplane at that time uh northwest airlines american united midwest and braniff were all on hand with new new airplanes of course it's august it's minnesota and it's hot and people still showed up there's some of the people you can see the people over here standing in the shadow of the wing it's so hot up there so uh as an appreciation from northwest airlines who had been here the longest to the city of rochester for building this new airport they brought out a brand new dc3 uh tail number was 21716 and they named it city of rochester and here is Edith Mayo, uh, Dr. Charlie's widow, mother of the year in 1940, and breaking a champagne bottle over the nose cone of the spinner there. And if you look at it, you can see the neck of the champagne bottle flying up in the air and great big block of wood that's taped to the front of the, <laughs> so it doesn't get all bent up. But she was out there and, and uh, christened the uh, airplane city of Rochester. Shortly after Pearl Harbor, the Fontana School of Aeronautics moved from Upper Michigan to Rochester. 
and they were taking advantage of the new radio equipment from the new airport. Plus, it's better snow removal equipment here than they had up in Michigan. And the first thing the, the Fontana School did, or did was to um, train pilots to be trainers at other bases around the country. And then after that, in, uh, in May of 42, Fontana got a contract to be a, a glider pilot training school and this would have been, from all we can determine, one of the one of the tow aircraft for the trainers up there. So, and some of the office staff standing in front of it there. In uh, July of uh, 1942, the uh, the first uh, school or the first students were graduated. They're standing on the steps of the old post office, it's downtown, or was downtown. And uh, this would have been the first group that graduated from the school. School ran from May until November. And uh, the one of the tragedies, and it's very few tragedies out here, but one of them was that on November 10th, they were going to uh, close the school and there was one pilot, he had a half hour training left and he took off from uh, up by Viola up on Viola Road. If you're familiar, there's an Air Force base up there, which is a whole other basket of fish. But there was uh, an Air Force base up there, and he took off out of one of the fields and crashed and was killed. Uh, he was the only casualty from the entire program, and he had a half hour training left. He was leaving there. He was flying back to, to uh, Rochester, and he would have been done. Uh, he had a 12-year-old boy with him who was kind of a gopher in the school, kind of an employee and a gopher in the pilot school. Uh, he would go on, his mother would have to sign for him, but he joined the army in the Air Corps in, when he was like 16, when the war broke out. And he was, he was in the service. He was so uh, caught up in the flying on that. October of 42, uh, the new control tower is built on top of the hangar that was already there. Uh, it was necessitated by the fact that there were now 250 takeoff and landings a day going on at the airport. This is 1942. And uh, the Weather Service, which had formed years earlier, now made their office out at the airport also. So it, they had current details on the weather. Uh, the same month, the, uh, the runways that we saw were lengthened out to 4,200 feet. And extra land was bought, which brought up the uh, the total acreage of 600 acres on the airport in case it needed to be expanded. This would have been October of 1942. And of course, everybody says, well, how do you know it was October of 42? And I say, these buildings right here. Uh, there would be a total of 11 buildings built. This would be the base for the uh, transportation base that started up there. When the uh, glider pilots left, they started to use this as a transportation base. They would bring aircraft in from the manufacturer. They would be on their way to Russia for the Lend-Lease program. And they would land in Rochester. They would refuel, change pilots, fix the airplane service them, whatever they needed. And they went on from there and ended up going across, halfway across the Aleutians where they were picked up by Russian pilots and taken into Russia. And this base right here was uh, the beginning of the uh, uh, base. One was a mess hall. There was sleeping quarters. There was a recreation hall in the office for the for the facility there. This is a actually was taken shortly after the war, but you can see the buildings. All the buildings are there, and it's a great con contrast to what the airport looked like in the mid 1940s at that time. Uh, down here in the corner, of course, we have ear corn. And so it kind of gives you an idea where you're at. And uh, this is 13th Street. And if you live in this area and live on 13th Street between like 6th and 8th Avenue, and knowing that your house was built on a military base, there's, people go, huh, what? what are you talking about? But uh, anyway, it gives you a good contrast to what was going on. Um, the barracks would end up being the 11th Ferrying Service, 
Detachment Ferrying Division, Air Transport Command. That's a lot of stuff to put on a badge. <laughs> and uh, the commanding officer was Hollis Roundy. And at that time, they were bringing in P-39 Air Cobra fighter planes. And if you know anything about fighter planes, uh, P-39 had an Allison V-12 engine that sat behind the pilot, ran backwards and ran a drive shaft under his feet to the propeller instead of having the prop out front or the motor out front. Uh, the Army didn't want them, so the Russians got them. Uh, later on in the war, they would be modified. They would change them to uh, P-63s. It was a little bit bigger, a little bit heavier aircraft. Uh, the important thing is they would come in three, four, five at a time. If you can imagine five aircraft landing at one time, all on the ground at the same time, and was all women pilots would get out. These was WASP pilots uh, flew a lot of these planes out there. Um, of course, there's a legend where the WASP pilots stayed in the house that Al Capone lived in, which is also a legend, but you know, legends are always good. Uh, the only proof I ever found in the newspapers for a WASP pilot is one of them was at Lawler Cleaners, rode her bicycle down there, and her jacket that had been in the basket was stolen. And it had a story in the paper, if you've got it, bring it back, no questions asked. I don't think she ever got it back. But uh, that's the only proof I ever, have ever seen of there were WASP pilots in town, so... If you've got more, I'd love to hear it. So, uh, in uh, August 15th, or was in the summer of 44, actually, uh, the airport would be a site of uh, secret research by the Mayo Clinic and the War Department. They were perfecting the G suit for military pilots. The suits are still used today. A friend of mine is a, a called himself a B 52 driver, he's a retired. Uh, Air Force, and he goes, yep. He says, I remember wearing those seven Gs. As long as you got your suit inflated and you're doing the M1 maneuver, he says, you're good to go. So he was there. I got to believe him. So uh, what they did here is they, uh, they got a, a Dauntless, Douglas Dauntless aircraft. It was a dive bomber, an A-24. And Kenneth Bailey, who's in the front seat, would take it up to 10,000 feet, put it into a dive, and would circle in toward the ground and uh, they would inflate this to see if they get the guy and the guy in the back to pass out or how well he would take this. Uh, plane was nicknamed G Wiz. You can see the G in the, in the front there. Uh, the guy in the back is Dr. Earl Wood. Well, that's Charlie, I, Code. That's Charlie Code. Well, his, okay. I'll believe you because the, uh, the book that I got this out of calls him Earl Wood, and then his his son was in here. Oh, yeah, okay. Rest my case. <laughs> you, you demand, you demand. So anyway, uh, he, if you haven't seen, he's got a great book. It's for sale out here. Tells about his father's training out here in Mayo Clinic and and their what they did with the war, and. Uh, it's it's just it's a great story. I'm about halfway through it. So, but uh, there's a, another picture of the Dauntless, and in the back you can see where it's the transportation. It's been written on the front of the hangar up there. Uh, August fifteenth of forty five, the the war with Germany ends. The last of the P sixty three King Cobras comes through town takes off, buzzes downtown Rochester, scares all the starlings out of the trees downtown. And yeah, and uh, it was uh, their salute to the people of Rochester, thanking them for what they had done throughout the war. Um, it should be noted that every plane that took off out of Rochester made it to its destination without a problem. Where it went from there, who knows? And during the war years, there was as many as 10,000 flights takeoffs in and out of Rochester Airport. And uh, that's just, that's part of the program there. In uh, the war is over, federal money that was used to maintain the airport is gone because Mayo Clinic owns it, it's a private airport. So the way they got around that is Mayo Clinic gave it to the city of Rochester. The city of Rochester hired Mayo Clinic to run it for 30 years. Federal money came back in. Uh, I like this picture. If This is one of these that's fun to blow up. 
because if you look here, there's a, they were called Dallas buildings. They were basically a step above cardboard style buildings, but these were the, that's the military base. If you look over here, this is the fairground. There's actual Quonset huts over there. Those were built in 46. And if you look over here, there's a hundred prefab homes that Mayo Clinic built uh, that was also in 46, which kind of gives us a, a time frame of where this picture was. But people will argue that, uh, well, these are Quonset huts and those are Quonset huts. No, these are Dallas buildings. These are Quonset huts. It's, and I, I show this picture to people and I still want to argue with this. This is what it is. Um, the Rochester Airport returns to uh, civilian life. And if uh, you remember what I told you earlier, this is city of Rochester. This is city of Rochester in a war get up. Uh, the picture, of course, up here, you can't see it very well, but up here it says buy war bonds. Doesn't say Northwest Airlines on it. So uh, she was up there doing her, doing her part. The, uh, this is taken from inside that fancy terminal that I showed you, people watching come up there. The uh, terminal was expanded. They came in and uh, put an addition here for other airlines to have service counters and they built a restaurant on the end here. A uh, restaurant was open to the public. They invited people to come out. They had a parking lot on one end. You could park, get something to eat, go out and hang on the fence and watch the airplanes take off, which was uh, great entertainment for what I was told. Um, Albert Lobb, before he came to the Mayo Clinic in 1925, he was comptroller of the University of Minnesota. And he was hired to be a manager for the at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, he became president of the Rochester Airport Company at its inception in 1928. And he retired in 1949. Uh, September 29th of 52, the airport was officially renamed Lobb Field in his honor. And it became known as Lobb Field till the end. And uh, busy day at Lobb Field. Uh, 1955, they realized that the future of air travel belonged to jets. Jets were faster, they were heavier, needed longer runways, um, and there wasn't room to expand Lobb Field. It just wasn't there. Plus the fact the city of Rochester is encroaching on three sides. So they began to look at, uh, at different spots and they did come up with a spot uh, that was northeast or northwest corner of the intersection of Highway 63 and Minnesota Highway 30. Uh, the city was able to buy 2000 acres of land to build an airport. And uh, meanwhile, it's business as usual at the Rochester airport. Uh, they did have its own fire department. It was outside of the city limits. So they did have their own their own fire department down there. Uh, I would say the thing I, I would really love is a 58 Chevy two-door station wagon. But yes, yeah, uh, the uh, in 1957 they broke ground on a four million dollar airport, which would be uh, eight miles south of Rochester and on what would end up being one of the finest airports of comparable size of any city. And uh, here you go, it was September 23rd of 1960, the, the airport opened. Rochester RST, we call it now. Um, two days after that, Lobb Field would officially close to the public. It would take a month for Gopher Aviation to get their equipment out. So they still use the airport uh, runways a little bit. And uh, the VIPs, we, we see them now, they come in in huge jets, they park all over the place. But in, uh, in uh, 1960, October 10th, you know, the first VIP comes to Rochester. And we know it's very early because there's no exhaust stains on the runway up here yet. On the the uh, people parked all over the place. Uh, anybody know who the VIP was? Richard Nixon. Vice President Nixon was running for president and it was a whistle stop. He, uh, they flew in, he got out of the plane, waited everybody, looked like he's gonna push Trisha down the stairs, um, gave a speech, got in the plane, gone, just like that. 
Uh, on the 17th of October of 1960, the runways at Lobb Field were marge, marked with large X's and it was officially closed. Uh, after that, the stories get, get kind of strange. It was Lover's Lane. It was a racetrack. Uh, it's where I learned to drive. Um, there's several stories of what went on out there. Um, the epilogue is the original Graham Field is part of the uh, Olmsted County Fairgrounds, now known as Graham Park. Uh, Rochester Airways location was on the northeast corner of today's Second Street and 23rd Avenue Northwest or Southwest, I'm sorry, and is home to Cascade Lake, Mayo Employees Credit Union, among other businesses. And Lob Field became Meadow Park, quiet subdivision created by Mayo Properties Association and a home to thousands of Rochester citizens, most of whom have no clue as to why they can't dig a hole in the backyard. <laughs> right, Gary? Yep, we're going that. And that's what I've got for you tonight. Thanks for coming out on this winter's night. That's how many people have flown out of Lot Field? I couldn't tell you. I, I've never found a. I flew out twice. Oh, yeah? 1958. DC3 and 57 at Minneapolis and 58 at the twin engine something that I flew to St. Louis. That's all I remember. Yeah. The uh, it's always interesting to watch what would fly in and out of Lob Field. The um, uh, city of Rochester. I was kind of intrigued by that to see what kind of history, and you can trace the histories of some of these planes by their tail number. And you can get online, and it's a rabbit hole. You can fall down and not come out for days. Uh, city of Rochester was, ended up being sold to a feeder airline out of Wisconsin, and it was involved in an accident, taxi taxiway accident, cracked into another airplane. It was fixed and, and went back in the air, went back to service, and uh, it was flown or sold to another smaller airline, and eventually it was sold to someone in Venezuela. So it ended up uh, in, in the jungles of South America. Somewhere in the city of Rochester, probably different tail numbers on her, but she may still be flying uh, contraband out of, uh, but it, yeah, it might still be out there, but it's it's interesting story on those. So, yes. Uh, that is a, that's a good thing for you to research. <laughs> I've, I've got uh, a couple of different stories where they've closed down different divisions, they, they built a lot of radial aircraft engines there. And they did a lot of uh, radar and radio installations. And when the radial engine kind of went away, their business kind of went with it. And I know that different divisions closed down. And I think they end up, or I think they may be signature service down there that just sells fuel now. That might be the, might be the tail of it. But I have seen newspaper stories where they are closing down different sections of it. The guys who started it, of course, they moved on to different things and and uh, comes under different management. And some people like them, some people didn't. You know, kind of that kind of thing. But yeah, that's a good thing for you to do. I can get you started. I got I got a rabbit hole for you to go down on that one. So yes, my father was uh, an electrician when he finished high school in Rochester. And uh, was the person who wired the red light, the first red light on the corn cob. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Someone told me once that he also wired the revolving spotlight to the plumber filter. Well, that might have been him in the picture. There was a there was a newspaper story about a reporter went up to the top of the plumber and and was going to go out on the roof and he kind of chickened out. He didn't. Uh, didn't make it all the way out there, but he was telling how windy it was up there. And this guy crawls up and he's changing the light on it or some dumb thing. But he says, "Yeah, he just couldn't couldn't bring himself to come around that last corner and get outside." Him. No, I'm not going out there. No. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Hey. Thank you. Thank you.